Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us this morning for our annual policy breakfast. This is the first policy breakfast we're having since I've been executive director because of COVID, obviously, and I find it timely um, and appropriate that the topic this morning is on childcare. When I sat down last night to think about what I wanted to say this morning, so much came to mind. With the current political landscape in our country stacked on top of a world recovering from the pandemic, I felt an overwhelming sense of responsibility to start by acknowledging our childcare providers. In March of 2020, the world shut down, but our childcare providers woke up as they have every other day and took care of our children. So our first responders and essential workers could show up and take care of the sick. Our childcare providers open their doors every day of the pandemic, as they have always, and despite the lack of recognition for the importance of their role in society. These are the people that not only kept Marin working and our country working through a pandemic, but they cared for our children as their own, providing nurture and care during a time that was so unpredictable for so many. And I want to acknowledge and thank them for all they've done, but even more so always, but even more so during the pandemic. So let's give our childcare providers a round of applause. <clears throat> the pandemic only illuminated and exacerbated the issues that have persisted within the childcare infrastructure of this country for decades. With the average cost of licensed infant care at $2,200 a month in Marin County, the cost of childcare is prohibitive for so many working parents. I'm a mother of two, I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old, and the only way that I'm able to be a member, a contributing member of the workforce is because I have a mom who can help take care of one of my children while I pay the $2,400 a month for my three-year-old, um, and so, I'm lucky enough to have that, but not, as we know, not everyone has that, um, has that blessing. And if I were to pay for both children to be in care, it would be a financial strain on my family. A lack of accessible and affordable childcare was the top reason mothers left the workforce last year, according to the Motherly State of Motherhood report that was just released. The report surveyed 17,000 mothers in early March of 2022 and found that 26% of millennials and Gen Z mothers say they left their jobs in the last year due to childcare issues. That jumped to nearly two in five for um, Gen X mothers. Among mothers who were still employed as of March of 2022, 46% reported they originally quit because they couldn't access childcare. And even still, our childcare programs have suffered financial hardship. According to the National Women's Law Center, the childcare sector is still missing one in nine jobs lost since the pandemic began. The childcare system is near collapse after the pandemic with families covering the costs together with childcare providers who subsidize the care with the poverty level wages that many of them earn. We have a system that's unaffordable for parents and yet unsustainable for providers. And we know the positive impacts of high quality childcare on our children's development. And we also know the critical need of childcare in order to get the population back into the workforce and rebuild the economy. So now is the time to prioritize childcare. Paul. <laughs> Policymakers need to put in place policies that help our babies and families. There have been persistent disparities in health and development that have been draining the future potential and have, exacerbated, have been exacerbated by the ongoing pandemic. For far too long, society has undervalued the critical role of early educators, a workforce primarily comprised of women of color. Strengthening the infrastructure and supporting the workforce will ensure that the people who care for our youngest children can continue to provide them with high quality care and education in order to maximize positive outcomes for our future. Childcare won't be successful until it's a government and business priority. This is exactly why we've invited our panelists here this morning. We have Blake, Mike Blakely today from the Marin Economic Forum, Joanne Webster from San Rafael Chamber of Commerce, and Aideen Gaidmore from Marin Child Care Council. And with that, I'd like to invite them up for our panel 
conversation. Thank you. Well, good morning. Thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, we're going to start with just some introductions, so um, maybe we can just start this way. And Mike, feel free to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about um, how your work intersects with the childcare sector, or how you can see it intersecting. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, <clears throat> my name is Mike Blakely. I'm the CEO of the Marin Economic Forum. That is a 501c3 public benefit organization here in Marin County. And really what we do is provide research and advisory on the Marin County and the regional economy. And we do that um, in hoping to serve as a resource for the community so that people can understand about the economy and then make good decisions about the economy. So I've spent the last few years in this role trying to teach people that economies are more about business and, and they involve your workforce and the public sector that regulates the economy and the education sector that prepares that workforce. And as we learned, admittedly, uh, during the pandemic, um, childcare is a part of the economy as well. Not just for the obvious reasons that people need to work, parents need to work, and businesses need employees, um, but children also need developmental assistance and, and need those education opportunities at the very early age. So um, we're starting, um, because we did not previously, um, we're starting to look more deeply at that issue. Wonderful. Thank you. Hi, everybody. So I'm Aidan Guidemore, Executive Director of Marin Child Care Council, which is our local resource and referral agency. And basically, we eat, sleep, drink childcare. So <laughs> we are childcare. We are the main contact with all of the childcare providers in the county. Um, our childcare centers, our family childcare homes, family, friends, and neighbor, and our state funded programs. And we also help parents find childcare. We help them with their search around childcare and the best options for them. And we also <clears throat> are pretty much the trusted resource in the county for data on anything childcare. So when you think childcare, think Aideen and her <laughs> fantastic team sitting over there. <laughs> President, oh, there we go, and CEO of the San Rafael Chamber of Commerce. We are the largest chamber in Marin County with over 500 employers as our members, representing over 26,000 employees in Marin across 25 different industry sectors. And the number one issue that our members are reporting is hiring. It doesn't matter what size business, doesn't matter what sector. And child care has been identified as a major reason why many people have left the workforce, especially women, or reduced their hours of work. Our chamber is also part of a larger coalition of diverse Marin businesses called Keep Marin Working. And after, during the pandemic, because it's not over yet, during the pandemic, we developed an 11-point recovery framework plan to help the county recover and get our businesses back to work. And childcare was part of that 11 point plan in addressing the crisis that we're in with childcare shortage in Marin. So I'm delighted to be invited to this panel and have this conversation today. Thank you. Thank you so much. So Aideen, I'm gonna start with you. Given that you and the team at Marin Child Care Council worked so closely and supported the childcare sector during the pandemic, uh, what would you say were the challenges that the sector has faced over the years that were exacerbated by the pandemic? So, Pega, I think you stole everything I was going to say <laughs> with your opening <laughs> remarks. <clears throat> I think you're going to hear this on repeat. But um, before I talk about the challenges, and there were and are challenges for our field, I wanted just to say a few words. Bravery, tenacity, courage, resourcefulness, flexibility, passion, dedication, commitment, diversity. That is our ECE workforce. And what they did over the past two years, which you said, was remarkable. And from all of us in our agency who really tried to support the field as much as we could during that crazy two years, it is, and I say this at every public um, meeting I am at, it is with our heartfelt thanks to all you have done for the past two years and all you do every day for children in this county. So thank you, any ECE professionals in here, and if you know one, say thank you to them, please. Um, okay, so now on to the fun part, the challenges. So there are many. I have 
been in my job for over 20 years. Our agency has been in the county for over 40 years. I've worked in ECE since I was 18. Went to college for ECE and went straight into working. And the cha I've also worked in Ireland, New Zealand, Australia, and here. So I've been worked in all around the world in ECE. And the challenges are the same as they were when I first started working. And they are the same in most countries. Unfortunately, America is a little bit behind other countries who have already got you know, universal preschool. They have subsidized childcare. They have all of that. We're still trying to work on that in this country. So um, there are a lot of challenges. I'm going to just run through a few of the main points that I think are important for this group to know. The first one is staffing. So there is a huge staffing crisis in our field right now. There was a staffing crisis before COVID. We were aware there was a shortage of our staffing. But during COVID, remember, these teachers were going into classrooms and were very stressed out. And the children were suffering trauma from this fear about pandemics. People left our field. Older people were like, I don't need to do this anymore. I'm not going to do this anymore. The younger people weren't encouraged to come in to put themselves at risk for a field. Um, there is, we are at like a critical crisis point for staffing for our field. And I know many sectors are in Marin, but I need you to think that if you are coming an entry level worker into ECE, you could get paid more and get better benefits and get better support if you worked in Starbucks or in and out. So when they're all hiring, that's the same pool we're trying to hire from. So it, it really is critical that there has to be something addressed statewide and locally to really work on how we can recruit teachers into our field, keep them there, and support them with good wages, good benefits. The second issue that you mentioned, Pega, too, is the cost of care. So I was listening to this podcast and was talking about childcare, because as I said, eat, sleep, breathe. Mm -hmm. And they were saying that childcare is a bad business model. And the reason it's a bad business model is because providers can't charge what they need to charge to provide high quality care. Yet what they're charging now, parents can't afford to pay for anyway. So it's really, it's, it's such a difficult business. And remember, 90% of the programs in our county are small businesses. They are individual businesses who are operating childcare settings. So they have to try and make money from this business, yet they really can't charge what they need to do. So there has to be more subsidized childcare. Businesses have to step up and say, we are going to provide subsidies for women, mostly, who want to get back into the workplace and can't afford childcare. So there has to be, again, some type of system that really looks at addressing that issue. How do we subsidize our childcare programs so they can afford to provide high quality care and recruit teachers who are going to stay because they've got good benefits and wages, but also parents need help paying for childcare because they can't even go to, to get their kids into childcare. So that would be our second big challenge. And again, we've seen that in the cost of care during the pandemic for our childcare providers skyrocket because they were dealing with, oh my gosh, like less children they could serve, their capacity reduced because they could only serve less children. They had all of this extra cleaning to do. I mean, they were, I was going through some um, old papers from like two years ago, when the first stages of the pandemic with my staff the other day. And we were getting all these questions from providers like, can I put their backpacks beside each other? Now just think about that. This is what's going on in these people's heads as they're taking care of the youngest children. I don't even know if I'm allowed to put backpacks beside each other hanging up. Do they have to be 10 feet apart? What are we going to do? And all of these changes they had to make to their programs. I mean, we had providers say to us when we were surveying them through this whole past two years, trauma was a huge deal for them, but the financial burden. These, these businesses, and not many of them applied for these small business loans, so these businesses were going into their own savings, their retirement, refinancing their houses, not being able to pay their mortgages because they were running these childcare settings. So obviously that is a huge issue we have to look at. Equity, and we throw this word around. We throw this word around in this county, and it's, there's always, you know, pivot was a word for a while, right? You know, um, silos was another word we all use in our nonprofit world. Well, equity is thrown around, but I want you to really think about this when it comes to our workforce. Majority of women, low-income women of color, and when our school system, and I'm not, I love our school system, our public school system, Mary Jane Burke is amazing, but when our school teachers were told, who are primarily white women, that they did not need to go into their classrooms because it would be too risky for them, our field were told, go into those programs, open up and serve children. So just think about that, everybody in this room, and think about equity. And then think about what we did to support those people. I'll leave that one there. And then perception. 
the perception of childcare is an issue we've had forever, right? We're, we're minding babies, we're babysitters. What's happening there? How many reports do we have to put out there that say, and research, scientific research, studies, you know, the best people in the world saying 90% of brain development happens in the first five years. Yet, we treat childcare secondary to our school systems. We treat it, you get paid more to work in, in and out than to work in a childcare setting. So how do we, as a community and as a county, value our youngest children and our childcare workers? So again, that is that perception of what we do is another struggle. That again has happened over the past 30 years. And I just hope, you know, to end on a more hopeful note, <laughs> that what we saw and how we saw our field stand up and be heroes, along with doctors and nurses and first responders who went into those classrooms terrified every day that they could die, that the children in their care could die, or their family members could die. I hope that we as a county will actually keep that in our head and remember it is time for every single person in this county to invest in zero to five. Thank you so much. So obviously we've been talking about how the pandemic has impacted the world and the field in particular. And um, childcare, I, I really do feel like has been finally, it's starting to be recognized as a, as a priority and not just a parent problem, but an issue that needs to be addressed and that it, it's a, one that impacts us all. And so um, I'd love to hear each of your thoughts on the intersection between business and childcare as we think about rebuilding our economy. And anyone can jump in. Sure, I'm happy to start. Before I do, I just wanna say, this woman is a rock star, right? I mean, seriously. And any provider out there, thank you for what you do, truly. It, it, it's been a struggle. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, to quote um, a recent article in the Harvard Business Review, childcare affects when we work, how we work, and very soon it's going to impact where we work. So prior to the pandemic, uh, childcare as an, a benefit for employees was not part of an employer's package. Uh, but the pandemic has really raised our collective awareness of how critical a role childcare plays in the overall health of our economy and the overall health of a business. Uh, and so it's very costly for an employer to recruit employees, so they're really focused on retention strategies. And they understand that re reliable childcare can have an impact, you have less absenteeism, you have less turnover, and you have better morale of your employees. And reliable childcare can be the reason why a woman returns to the workforce, stays on a job, or takes a new job. We're also, lots of employers are looking at um, childcare as a recruitment strategy. And they want to be competitive in this very, very tight labor market. So there are examples out there, I just saw in the news the other day, of a company called Urban Plates. And they're out of San Diego, but they have locations here in the Bay Area, in Oakland, Dublin, and I believe San Francisco. And they are aggressively marketing that they will pay all of your childcare benefits if you come to work for their company. So that is one example, and as our chamber, we are, we are really encouraging our employers to explore adding these employer paid benefits as part of their packages. Also right here in our own backyard, Genentech is offering the service to help their employees find a provider that is right for their family. So there are new technology platforms out there where a provider can, for free, come online, they can promote their, their um, their uh, business, but the employer sends their employees directly to that platform, so again, they have lots of choices. Flexibility is really key. So I, I'll be quick, because I feel like I just have talked for too long the first part. Um, really, what we really want to see is businesses supporting childcare, like just exactly yeah. what you were saying. Like, uh, if any of you are local business owners, what can you do to encourage women to get back into the workforce? I have three children. And I work for a nonprofit. Yeah, that nonprofit gave flexible hours for me. I was allowed to work from home two days a week. We had a baby bonding policy. I could bring my baby with me to the office until it was six months old so that I didn't have to put my you know, 10 week old into childcare and I had that little bit of extra time. 
But I think really businesses need to partner. <clears throat> if they really think about what childcare, and they can contact us and we can let them know, what childcare is in their community. How can they help maybe sponsor the childcare setting? If they can't afford to pay childcare for every single um, parent, some type of subsidy to take to allow those parents go to that childcare setting. Um, it's really, you know, we know the economy won't be built back if we don't have childcare. And we also know the women will not go back into the workplace if childcare is prohibitive to pay for. So as any good business owner, anything you can do, and it can be as simple as that flexible schedule, so letting parents know that they, they only have to come into the office like two days a week or they get time with their child and supporting. And I think COVID taught us that. Like, it's okay for people to work from home and it's okay to have that flexibility. So I think there has to be more of a partnership between businesses and the childcare settings in their communities. Yeah, I, I agree with everything that's been said. I think the real challenge we have here is in Marin is a, is a county of micro businesses. Um, 85 plus percent of our businesses have eight people or fewer. Um, and the majority of those are four people or fewer. And so when you get to that type of a business, it becomes very difficult financially uh, and um, you know, with the time that is needed from the employee um, to accommodate childcare. And that's just a kind of a sad reality. So that doesn't mean it's okay. It means that there is a level of creativity and solutioning that we all need to do to work with those companies that are in our economy here. Um, we, like Joanne, we spend a lot of time researching what is everybody doing. Um, and the model that always gets held up in the North Bay is there's a company in Sonoma called um, Keysight Technologies that invested huge amounts of money into on-site care facilities with teachers and meeting all the regulations they needed to do. It was a long time because it's a heavily regulated industry, but they got it there. Um, but again, you're talking about employees in the biotech or technology sector who you know, have the resources potentially to be accessing private childcare anyway. Or maybe they have a spouse, which I'm very lucky, my spouse, she didn't work and she spent the time raising our children. Um, so you know, that was the model that we were able to do. Um, but, but again, bringing it back to Marin, if you look at the composition of jobs and employees in Marin County, there's an overwhelming proportion of low wage jobs uh, and low income people that are working those jobs. And so finding the solutions is very, very difficult. We can't just simply say businesses need to step up. There needs to be, yes, in, in my, well, <laughs> we, you can, and you, and you have been, you have been. Um, but there needs to be more of an understanding of what do our businesses look like and what are the specific challenges they have. And there needs to be some me mechanism for that if there isn't already. Pega, I'd like to offer. So another thing that, that obviously you would mention the cost of housing in addition to the cost of childcare and the Centerful Chamber yeah. is an advocate for housing production across all levels of income in our county. And one thing that we are asking developers is to add a child care facility within their housing development. So that's another option that we could look at in Marin as we move forward. This is a perfect transition to the next question, which uh, Joanne, I'd love to hear your perspective on about how the business sector and child care sector can create stronger partnerships. So we've been hearing about flexibility, but also the reality that most of our businesses are very small and have some challenges in thinking about what child care uh, benefits could look like. So Yeah, I thoughts? think cross-sector collaborations is key. Uh, working with the Marin Council of Chambers to provide feedback on ex existing programs and existing promotions and policies already in place at the county, but also to strategize on what the needs going forward are and what the trends are and also what the challenges are. Um, I think that um, there are examples of these collaborations cross-sector already in place with workforce de development and the healthcare sector. So they're already in place that we can just use those models. I also think that we could develop a communication plan where employers are aware of what's available to them and their employees. I think there's a huge disconnect right now. There's a lot of amazing work being ha uh, happening out there, but I'm not sure the business sector understands what that work is and, again, what's available to them. Wonderful. And what are some priorities for the Chamber of Commerce as it relates to advocating for family first policies? Yeah, thank you for that. And I had mentioned already our chamber is advocating for our employees to really explore adding those health, those child care benefits as part of their package. 
Um, they can either do it as completely employer sponsored or they can do it like healthcare benefits where the employee pays us you know into that program we're also really um, in trying to communicate the ROI on providing those benefits to their employees. Again, encouraging flexible work hours, encourage, making sure that you, that you have a very strong um, communicated remote work policy, and also to support um, women in your workplace, develop programs where women feel like they um, have a support network, whether it's mentoring, or others, um, and also our chamber is exploring these tech platforms I mentioned. There are companies out there where chambers can partner with them so that our employers can decide whether that's an option for them. And um, so the chamber would communicate that information out to its membership. Thank you. So Mike, the, the Marin Economic Forum provides information and opportunities to collaborate for improving Marin County's economic vitality while seeking to increase social equity and per protect the environment. So given this mission, what connection do you see between the child care sector and the county's economic vitality and what are some of the strategies that you all are exploring? That's a great question. So you um, correctly cited our mission statement, which was a bit convoluted. <laughs> um, and it also includes this term economic vitality, which has no singular definition. Um, and that's a term that gets used a lot, uh, especially when we're talking about recovery from the pandemic. But to us, it means, again, like I said, taking a more holistic view of the economy. It's not just about the businesses, but it's about all the pieces that make an economy work. And economies at the end of the day are about quality of life. So when we look at our work through that lens, childcare obviously becomes a huge piece um, for a couple of different reasons. Um, you talked about equity, um, and we've all heard the last couple of years, maybe more than we've ever heard about the inequality. We've all seen the data about Marin County specifically, um, where we score very poorly on racial disparity. Uh, we also have growing economic inequality, which is dangerous. Um, and so if you really want to tackle those bigger social problems, what we are now understanding ourselves as we've had to look at the child care issue where we really haven't previously, is that if you want to narrow those social and economic gaps, it needs to start, as you said, at the zero to five. And so we're trying to look at child care from the perspective, not as, well, parents need to work and employers need bodies, and so child care is the obvious solution. It actually is like, hey, wait a minute, in Marin County, we have these massive social issues that we've been challenged to deal with um, that have now been exacerbated by it, or our awareness has finally gotten to a point where it should have been about these issues, and what are the solutions? And narrowing in on the zero to five and what are we doing for children's development is something that our organization has never looked at before, but all of a sudden now, this is really fits into what we're trying to do when we look at the quality of life issue for the county. The other issue, um, so we're doing that for more from a research side because that's what, what we can do. We don't advocate, but we can certainly put out data that supports some of these, these issues. The other thing we're doing is really starting to look at our workforce uh, and our residents and what is the demand we have in the, in the, uh, for jobs, uh, but what are the opportunities that people who live in Marin have for career? And as I said before, we have a disproportionate amount of low-wage jobs in the in-person services sector. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that that is a problem, but what it does is it limits the economic mobility opportunities for our residents. And so what we're really interested in right now is how can we attract companies to locate in Marin that have more middle-wage jobs? How can we ensure that our workforce development practitioners are aligned to where our economic driver sectors are. So for example, our economic drivers is not restaurants, right? We all enjoy restaurants and they're a very important part of the fabric of Marin County. But from a perspective of providing good paying jobs that can allow people to live in Marin, we all know that that's just not the reality. So we need to start looking at the composition of the businesses that make up our economy and understand how are they doing, how are they creating jobs for our residents that are gonna allow them not just a living wage, but a flourishing wage. And so by taking that look at what are the employment opportunities, what, what career pathways do our teenagers, do our uh, working adults have to increase their incomes is another key part of this that's not, maybe not obvious, <clears throat> but when you start to look at 
the economy as a whole, and you start to look at quality of life, these are super important issues that we really haven't been able to touch on before. Um, and so the last point is, as some of you may know, we've partnered with the County of Marin to create what we believe is the first ever economic strategy. And in that strategy, we, are, we have gone through um, stakeholder focus groups with hundreds of people across the county, from older adults to youth to, we were in the Canal and West Marin and everywhere, businesses um, getting input. And it's obvious that people want better job opportunities in Marin County. Um, and this, uh, by the county proactively incorporating that into their policies and strategies, uh, we think that they, that can make a difference on that level. Wonderful. So before we open it up for q and A, I wanted you all have kind of touched on this, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to share if you had just one policy ask related to childcare and, and um, improving access and affordability and whatever it may be, um, what would that policy ask be that you would champion? You gotta have Maybe 20 of them. Go yeah. for okay. <laughs> I can't do You know one, there's not just right? one. I just can't I do know. one. That's it's fine, impossible. you can okay. get more okay. than one. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> what we really need to do, and we're fortunate that the Marine Community Foundation is investing some funding and some planning around ECE, but we really need to look at what needs to happen to our field to support it. Um, there is one bill, Senate bill, right now, because we haven't talked about TK, but TK is looming, and there's Senate Bill 976 by um, LEVA, L-E-Y-V-A, and that is um, asking for $750 million to go into universal preschool. So it's really looking at parental choice and how TK is a great option as part of our pre-K, but we really need to be supporting the preschool program so parents can have those non-traditional hours. They don't, you know, the holidays, the breaks, all of the things that the schools don't cover that as a working parent you need full-time, full-day care. So that's one bill. If you want to do anything, look that up and um, put your support to it. But I think we really need to look at the, the issues I said, um, salaries, access um, to training, and ideally my policy would be that we, we get another local tax initiative in this county that would look at increasing salaries for teachers to make sure that they can stay in the field to supporting our programs and to help parents pay for childcare. And we did have one and it didn't pass, but there is, it's a new day. This, all of you are suddenly understanding how important childcare is. So any policymakers in this room right now, please really think we're coming at you. We're going to do it. There's going to be a tax initiative in the next few years and we need your support in this. I believe that coming from Aideen. Um, <laughs> so the Santa Fe Chamber focus ma focuses mainly on local uh, policies and we would really encourage uh, the county and the city of San Rafael to look at streamlining the review and permitting process for the conversion of space into childcare use and make it very, very simple, uh, as well as on the state level um, to really streamline the process for licensing a childcare establishment. So those are two policies that we could absolutely get behind. Um, I just became familiar with SB 976, and um, the board, of, the chamber board of directors, is the one that um, uh, endorses policies. However, it is a solid piece of legislation, and I would uh, recommend that our board of directors look at that uh, that bill. <laughs> I would say, you know, I'll pick up on Nadine's point about businesses have to be involved. Um, you know, businesses respond better when you incentivize them rather than impose on them. So I think there are some opportunities to look at creative tax relief or, or uh, those measures where you're going to get a bigger response from businesses than if you ask them to pay more or do something. So, agree. I'm behind that. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much. And this is an opportunity for you all to step up, I think, to the mic, or are we passing it? OK, you can step up here and, and pose any questions to our panelists. Questions or comments? Yes, questions. Come on up. <laughs> So I'm a, a very shy, long-time commissioner, and I want to go back to uh, the tax issue which was in the ballot a few years ago. Uh, and we didn't hear the business community really step up to support that. Uh, and I understand the point that you made about tax relief, uh, but 
uh, that issue barely lost. We came very close to passing it and being the first county to do so. What will you do help the business community to support it when it comes back up again? Look was that, sitting to, was that to me? me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they have to. Are we talking more in strong starts, that, yeah. that ballot yeah. initiative? Yes. And I'm, I'm sorry, going back a few years, as I recall, we wanted to ensure that there was a uh, little bureaucracy in that tax measure, that, that, the, that it, the intention of the tax measure was helping those that needed it the most. And so as long as it's, it's written that way so that all of the funds go to the programming that's needed, um, then I would, most likely we would endorse that measure. Does that answer your question enough? <laughs> The Sandefeld Chamber has a very strong advocacy policy and we take our endorsements very, very seriously. And so we are looking for making sure that there's, there's um, oversight and making sure, again, that the, the funding goes where it's needed to go and that it's not paying additional salaries and, yeah. So we'd be happy to review that, that legislation again. Hi, I'm Emily Bugos. I'm the Child Development Program Manager at North Marin Community Services. Um, and I'm excited that we're talking about access and affordability and all of these ways that businesses can be partnering with their employees in order to make all of those things happen. But we know that access and affordability don't really matter if we don't have a childcare workforce. And I don't know how many teachers... <laughs> I don't know how many teachers are actually here in this space, people who are actually providing direct service to children in their FCCs or classrooms. Um, but my question, you know, one of the ways that we know that teachers remain in their classrooms and in their jobs, as wages aside, um, is by making them feel supported in the work that we do. And one of the ways that teachers, this is coming from a long time infant toddler teacher, uh, feel supported is when they're included in the conversations like we're having here today. So my question going forward, <laughs> For, for anyone, Pega included, um, is how are we currently or how are we going to involve teachers in these big conversations and in these decision-making processes? I can start with that, Andre. Um, I think that Marine Tracker Council is incredibly inclusive of the ECE um, community. I know that we listen to everything they say. and. As you know, I've always said I'm very fortunate to be sitting in this role that I can actually say these things and I get invited to these events. I know the work that we are hoping to be doing with the funding through the foundation will be inclusive of not only teachers' voices but parents' voices because any decisions that are happening on a ballot, and I think that's part of what happened with the original um, Strong Start. It was, it, that started from parent voices started that and, and they brought that, they, they did all of the ground work on that. They were out there you know, surveying parents and getting all the data to bring to the board. And then they suddenly, they, other people took over, you know, and they, their voices were no longer heard. So we are super sensitive to that. So as long as I'm, I'm in my role in this county and I'm not planning on going anywhere, I can guarantee you and I promise you that the voices of teachers will be included in any decisions that are being made about funding that comes into this county to support the ECE field, along with the voices of the parents who really need this funding. I would, I would just add to that that for First Five Marin and for myself being uh, stepping into this role that the voice of parents and providers is really important for me and ensuring that any decision that First Five Marin and the commission decides to make is informed by those voices and so I mean action speaks louder than words and so I think as we go into this we'll be demonstrating that that is a priority for us and um, we I always encourage that I have an open door policy if there is an issue or uh, concern that anyone has my email is on our website my office door is open and I always want to hear from particularly our parents and providers Hey there, <clears throat> Gary Besser, Marin County HHS. I'm in employment and training. Um, working with employers and job seekers, I've noticed consistently in relation to childcare, for a lot of workers, for what they're gonna be able to make, 
childcare is just a prohibitive cost. And in working with employers to stimulate hiring, a lot of employers want to do the right thing, but they just can't afford it. You know, they, uh, those micro businesses don't have the capacity to subsidize childcare themselves. So my, and we've all seen how slow <laughs> federal and state programs work, you know, take a look at the healthcare issue. There was a lot of momentum behind that, but we still don't have universal healthcare. Who knows how far off universal childcare could be. So my question is, what's your insight on what could be done at the local level uh, for publicly funded childcare centers? When you say what could be done, you mean as it relates to the financial side of it or just I guess the legislative and financial side of it. You know, I have a lot of observations about the availability of childcare, but you know, I'm, I'm not educated on what it would take politically, legislatively, um, and financially to, to be able to provide uh, a public childcare resource at the local level. A huge question, right? Yeah. <laughs> there are no easy answers to. But I would take the occasion to uh, refer to what Joanne mentioned about this group called Keep Marin Working, which our organization is also a part of. Um, we did have on an 11 point plan, child care, focused on child care. We didn't have specifics. But here's the important part about that that was the business community elevating the child care issue to an actual formal document that we submitted to the county. And I don't know if that's happened before. Joanne, you may know that. Um, but that is what put our organization on alert that this is something we better be looking at and get involved in and that also prompted the comment I made earlier that because of the unique dynamics of what our economy and what our businesses in Marin look like there maybe needs to be a, 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 collabor a new collaborative platform where at least the business and providers can start talking together because that I don't see how that's been happening before so it's an incremental maybe too small of a step for many of you in the room but the fact that that happened, I think, is a positive development there and could, it could lead to addressing those things that you point out. Can I add to that as well that a very wise woman I work with always says childcare is a snapshot in time. So people only care about childcare for that little period. You're in the public school system for 12 to 13 years. You're in childcare between one to five years. So even today, many of you will walk out of this meeting and not really think about doing anything. But to make a change, we have elected officials in this room now. They need to be hearing that people need childcare every day. That needs to be, they need to be under pressure as they want to get reelected to know childcare is my platform. That's something I need to do. Um, to fund childcare so that every person could have it universally, we know that Biden has that plan. It's being pushed back and it's, we're not getting support for it. We know that there's, it's a very divided um, country about what you know, parents should be allowed to have. But the more we raise our voices locally and the more we look at lo another local tax initiative that could provide some of that funding into the county and to make sure your elected officials who are here and who are not here are aware that childcare is vital for our economy and for our community and for our families. And so it's our responsibilities to keep that word out there. And I'm gonna add to that as well. And I don't know if we have this in, the, in our county, but I think relative to workforce development, if we were to partner with like College of Marin and we were able to take um, current childcare workers or prospective ones and actually train them specifically so it's raising the profile of that type of job, um, and then you can, you can use that also as a pipeline, perhaps that they can go into maybe the education um, the sector as well. So I think it's really creating a skilled workforce for that sector um, would make a difference. Okay, there it is. Um, Paula Carasquillo. Um, my daughter is uh, at Canal Child Care, um, which has actually been closed since yesterday due to lack of staffing. Um, and actually, this whole the Wednesday, Thursday, and today, actually. Um, and having not having staff, I know that that's the big issue. And even the teachers have come. Do you know anybody? And and I said, oh, okay. And of course, the topic comes up pay. Um, and I asked how much she, she asked, and she advised it's between this and this, and they have to be credentialed and all this, and, I'm, and my eyebrows shot up, uh, no. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know anybody that would do that job. Even people at La Parada, migrant workers, they will not take less than $25 an hour and you have to feed them. I mean, it's, 
it's disheartening for the children, for the teachers, um, and it's it's taking kids off routine. I mean, you, you're your mother of, of uh, toddlers. You know if you don't put them to bed at a certain time, they're a nightmare the next day. So can you imagine when your child's like, I miss my teachers, I miss my, my friends, I'm so sad. Like a little four-year-old telling me she's sad and depressed, this is heartbreaking. Um, I've been on the conversation um, with the parent groups um, with Romel, and I think I think you you're um, you are on that, or one of you might be. I've been on some of the meetings, um, and I, I had offered an idea, and I want to know what action plan is in place, or in thoughts, or in talks of maybe doing you know seeking out at colleges or places where kid where people are going to school for this type of work, and and doing programs where they can do. Um, um, internships or, or, or even doing programs where moms and mothers who want to go into the workforce can be trained to be child care providers along with being able to take care of their own children while taking care of others and learning and going through that credentialing process. Is there anything out of the box that's being thought of or that has been put onto the plate that maybe have gotten shot down that we can review again or anything like that? So I can tell you that we have partnered with College of Marin, we've partnered with um, the County of Marin, we've done all of these different to try and recruit people into the field. Um, it's a hard job to stay in, as you said, and if they're not getting the right salaries, it's not mm -hmm. happening. I think there's a few things that are happening. Our agency does a child care initiative project, which is a family child care training program that we, we try to recruit family child care providers and help them with the whole process of getting licensed, set up, so that they can provide care, and that's to increase the capacity and support them by whatever they need as they're going through this process, they go through a whole training. And we are working on that. And um, the county, as many of you probably saw, in the IJ released funding from the American Recovery Act funds for childcare. And so they did allocate 50,000 to help support that for us. Another program that we're in Child Care Council is starting is a, a pilot program, um, which is a teacher retention program. So we do not have much money, again, this is funded through the county, thank you very much, County of Marin. Um, it is 500,000 over two years and we will be recruiting entry-level ECE teachers and giving them similar to a guaranteed income to increase their salaries if they commit to stay in their position for two years. Mm -hmm. We would love that to be able to, to, be able to do the whole county and, and provide that type of training and resources, but there isn't the funding to do that. But Parallel to that, the foundation is funding work around planning for our, our field. And we saw what happened in San Francisco where they've just recently allocated like 83,000 for the wage increases for city employees. Um, I would love to see as we work on the funding with the um, money from the foundation, a group which includes teachers and parents and the key st stakeholders to look at is that something we can do in Marin that will be sustainable. We have seen our childcare centers get a lot of funding in stipends thrown at them in the past year and it's not sustaining staff. It's not keeping staff in their programs. We need to find something that will last and we need to have a little bit of time to plan it to get it going. And I think that the work we're doing, Pega, that will, the planning will start quickly and we really look at that. So I do feel hopeful. I would love to see what happened in San Francisco happen, but not just for city employees, for every ECE teacher in our county. And this small little pilot that we're doing, I have my fingers crossed that it'll be successful and effective and then we can use that to show policymakers, hey, this works. Like this is, we're keeping our teachers in the field. So we are, we're taking baby steps and we've taken baby steps through different programs for over, 30, 40 years in this county. But I think that seeing you know, a room like this full of, of these people and, and seeing how much childcare has been recognized through the pandemic, maybe there is hope, and with the support of our county and the foundation, there's hope that we could actually make a positive change in the next year and see us, and I know it's crisis, but at least you know, start this work and hopefully see a change and see us value the EC workforce the way they should be valued. Yes, thank you. But I, I would also add, you, you raised of, of why this is a, a crisis in, in able to not being able to have staff. But here's the other talking point. Marin's labor force has been and continues to decline, and it will decline. Um, since the pandemic, since we've been tracking this very closely, we've lost 4% of our workforce, which is about 5,000 individuals that are, that are out of the workforce right now. We don't know if they will ever come back. And there's nothing in the data that we look at to suggest that we are going to increase our population. Um, and so, yeah, this is a crisis and another talking point is that all of these uh, employers that are fighting for these employees are fighting for a diminishing pool of people regardless of what the job is. 
And so uh, that's another talking point for you all, is this is not gonna get better as it relates to bodies being able to fill these jobs. Good morning, I'm Tracy Hessel. I'm a pediatrician at the Marine Community Clinics. And first I just wanted to express gratitude for the work Edine and the council have done all these years. Um, and our child care providers, we've so seen how not only have you been there consistently, but stayed there consistently through the pandemic, and we really saw the impact of that on our, on our child care providers. I had a comment and a question. The comment, I was really interested in this idea about how employers can think creatively about supporting um, working mothers, or working families, really. Um, one thing that I just have to say, and I understand why some platforms might make sense, because Employers employ people from out of county, especially given the cost of living, but I just have to put a plug in that there's no better place to go for matching you to in-county child care than the Child Care Council. So I just had to say that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you. <laughs> and just to better understand the scope of the problem, because it waxes and wanes, but just to get a sense of where we are with the crisis, We've been so grateful over the years for your one-stop shopping, the one place where you can go to apply for subsidized childcare. Can you talk about kind of how many spaces are available and what kind of demand there is and where that, that gap is? Thank you. So for capacity, our, all of our programs have reduced capacity since COVID. We've seen, and the, the staff in crisis programs aren't opening up the same amount as they are. The demand for childcare, we still, I mean, we've, we've traditionally had at least 700 kids on our wait list who are eligible for subsidized childcare and who are not being served. So that sits there. Right now, we're probably at about 350, 400. Um, and we had funding come, federal dollars come down to do some extra subsidies. So we have been really trying to um, get kids enrolled and get kids provided with services. Um, but. The, um, there is still a huge demand in the county. There are still people who aren't being served. And as people are coming back out from the pandemic, we're seeing they're now starting to say, oh, I, you know, I need to get back to work. I need childcare. What do I need to do? And how do I get back into that childcare system? So, um, and we also have the continuous issue of what we call the cliff effect of parents who get their subsidies and they are, they earn, they go over their earnings by a little bit and then they either have this huge family fee to pay or they are no longer eligible for a subsidy. So they fall back off the system and they don't get any support again. And we are aware that um, subsidy, you know, in Marin, rent and housing and childcare are the biggest expenses. And if a parent doesn't have access to vouchers and subsidy for childcare, pretty much that is their safety net service. Without that, they lose their jobs and they lose their housing. So, um, yeah, there's still a need. I mean, we, it's definitely decreased, but we are looking at numbers. And I'm looking at my group over there in case they're like, no. <laughs> um, they're, uh, we still see the need, so yeah. And thank you for plugging us so much. I didn't pay you or anything. I appreciate it. Can I comment on that real quick? Sure. So thank you for the recognition of all of the work that the Child Care Council does. And since we have a lot of our uh, supervisors in the room, I want to put a plug in for creating a new position, which could be an employer liaison. So it would help the Child Care Council liaison with the employers so that, again, the employers understand what the work is being done already. You guys are being so <laughs> nice to me today. <laughs> this is a great Friday morning. We have about five more minutes for questions. Oh, and I'm going to be the challenging person. I'm Dr. Cindy Acker, and I am former vice president of the National Child Care Association. Okay. Um, I offered for my teachers to work in the classroom this morning so that they could be here today, so that their voice could be heard. Um, and they opted for me to come because they felt that because it's been so hard to have teachers in the classroom that they needed to keep the consistency for the children and for parents. But I want to say that if we really want to know the voices of the teachers, then we need access. We need to, to allow them to speak when they are available to speak. And when we continue to have meetings during times like this when they are in the classroom, that isn't possible. Um, it was one of the greatest difficulties that I had as VP is that we needed to be able to find ways to um, allow providers to actually speak um, when they had the opportunity to. 
I also want to say that we spent a lot of time asking large businesses and encouraging large businesses to put money into child care. And when we talk about policies, I think it's just time to, to say it. It's time to just demand it. That if you are a large business, that there is a portion that you need to provide that goes to child care or that you're providing child care on site for your employees and that it's not an option. Because what it does is to put, it pivots um, providers and parents in a situation that neither of them can get out of because, as was mentioned, they can't afford what is is charged and they can't pay what's charged. Um, and and it's it's time to to stop. We we had these conversations 40 years ago yeah. when I first started my school, and if we're yeah. still having the same conversations, then it's time to just say this is what the requirement is and this is what we need to do in order to fund child care. And I'll be quick. I also want to say that access to providers is really critical. There, there have been two grants, um, one that just happened and one that is coming that are facilities grants. And there are so many providers that did not know anything about it. The next one that's coming up is a million dollar grant for expansion. Um, and there hasn't been an avenue to be able to provide the information and to give a workshop for providers to say, this is how you fill out this paperwork. This is how you fill out a grant. If in fact we're trying to expand childcare, then why in the world are we not supporting the people who can do it, but just putting out a grant with a 30 day um, time frame to turn it back in and then not have enough people applying for it because they didn't know or didn't know how. So I just have to say, um, we're in Child Care Council hosted several workshops and did on site application processing with our providers to help them through that process of those grants oh, in that that's short wonderful. turnaround and we didn't get any funding to do that work. Our, my staff sitting over there were working like up till like eight nine o'clock at night having providers come in after work so that they could go through the whole grant with them so they could help them do it. So it may not seem like that help is happening but I think we are actually really trying that to get grant. that. In Marin. Wonderful. Yeah so we Wonderful. have been doing that work and yeah for sure. Wonderful. And, and the last thing um, that I want to mention is that there have been many grants that have come up during COVID. Um, what I did was to, to ask, could the money go to my staff? And if it could, then I gave it to my yeah. staff. And that's really nice. It shouldn't have had to, to yeah. take that. I shouldn't have had to make the decision, but I opted for my staff because it was really critical that my staff um, can, could continue. We don't even look at minimum wage at our school. We look at living wage in the area, and that is the minimum for us, is the living wage for our staff. And we sweat it. Um, but it's the only way that we can keep our teachers in. Um, and finally, I just want to say to Mike, I think it's Mike, um, and, and this is more an educational piece. I think for everybody, you mentioned that um, your wife stayed home to raise her children. There are so many parents right now who felt this terrible guilt and um, it just exacerbated itself during COVID that they weren't home um, raising their children and so they have opted to try to stay home and raise their children. Working parents raise their children. Um, so they, they raise their children and they work. And, and we're the, we're the partner with that, to be able to support them to do that. And so I think it's just a language issue that we need to really support parents who are in that place where they need to go out, but then they don't go out, that we can say, yes, you can raise your children. We will actually support you. There are workshops that you can attend, and our staff are here to be able to help you care for your children. Maybe, maybe just one more comment, or? I can, I can ask at the table later. Okay. Thank you. I just have a comment. So I'm Meredith Parnell, and I'm here representing the Marin Organizing Committee. And I just want to point out that we're seeing the same issues with IHS caregivers, and we've been really yeah. talking about um, what it would take to raise the living wage here in Marin. And I think that there's a lot of um, potential energy and collaboration around issues both for, for older people as well for younger people. They have, they, it's just very similar in terms of not having a real career path and it not being attractive work and it being really, really hard work. So I, I do want to, I understand the focus on getting funding for children, but I think living wage campaign that covers all of those workers might be a useful thing to talk about. Thank you. Thank you so much for all the questions and comments, and thank you to our panelists. Maybe one round of applause. Thank you.
Thank you guys so much. So um, thank you. That was a perfect segue into our keynote, and I'm excited to introduce Senator McGuire, who is here with us this morning for our keynote. Welcome the Senator up to share with us what's happening with child care at the state capitol. So thank you. Hi, thank you. What's going on? This is it. This is it. Go. This is what's going on. Thank you so much. Hey, good morning. Good morning. How the heck's it going? Happy Friday? Okay, uh, we need some more coffee in this damn house. Hey, see, there we go. My goodness. Uh, first and foremost, just uh, really excited to be with you today. I want to acknowledge First Five Marin. If we can give them a round of applause for bringing us together. Come on now. I uh, want to acknowledge, of course, that we have uh, Supervisor Rodoni and Connolly in the house today, President Jackson from the San Rafael School Board. We have Councilwoman Kurtz and Councilmember Lucan. Thank you so much, and so many others. And uh, if I miss somebody, I apologize, and we will mention in just a moment. But uh, really grateful uh, to be able to be here with you today. And I think that we can all agree, prior to the pandemic, prior to the pandemic, the Golden State had a severe child care shortage. Am I right? Uh, coming out of the pandemic, the shortage is more acute and more challenging than ever before. Am I right, ladies and gentlemen? Um, and parents, parents are at their wits end. And providers are barely hanging on, especially here in Marin County. And as we know, and I'm preaching to the choir here today, Marin County is some of the most expensive child care rates in the entire state of California. These high rates negatively impact families and employers as we just heard from our previous panel. And ultimately, and I think that we can agree, ultimately, these high rates impact the well-being of our entire community. And it makes it tough for working families and middle-income parents to be able to call Marin and the entire Bay Area home. And I'll be honest, I know this struggle firsthand. I was raised by a single mom, and she worked every day to be able to pay rent and put food on the table. And growing up, I remember the stress that my mom was under, constantly trying to patch together childcare between my grandma and a home-based provider. And then fast forward to today, we have a 13-month-old. He is hell on wheels. Um, and my wife, Erica, and I have been on a waiting list for 15 months for an infant childcare spot. 15 months. So this morning, if you are one of the heroes, one of the heroes within the child care system, I'd like you to stand up. Stand up. Let's give them a round of applause and say thank you. I want to hear you, Marine County. Let's say thank you to these amazing women and men who are the driving force, driving force of child care here in Marine County. Thank you. But I think that we need to be candid this morning, and I know that this group will be. Talk is cheap. The best way that this state can show its sincere thanks and to child care providers in our system is investing in each and every one of you. Investing in the resources that will make the system stronger, and that means we invest in the educators and the workers who are the heart of the child care system in Marin and throughout the state of California. So let's get into it. Let's get into how the state's going to be investing in child care. So last year's state budget, as many of you know, made historic investments in childcare. We're starting to see that play out this year. $5.8 billion in new funding to be exact. The state increase, increased rates across the board and it's about damn time. And we doubled state subsidized childcare spots going from 200,000 originally up to 400,000. We added 200,000 new spots. Now these new childcare spots are gonna come online over the next four years with 120,000 new child care spots coming online this year and an additional 80,000 over the next four years. You also know that we included an additional $600 per child stipend that went to child care providers. That's simply not enough. And the state legislature advanced a hold harmless policy for all providers, which ensured that pre-pandemic funding held steady because so many lost kids throughout the pandemic. 
We also provided 250 million in one-time investments to retrofit and upgrade and expand childcare facilities. And we're finally putting more money into the pockets of providers and educators by advancing rate reform. And this rate reform is gonna benefit childcare and preschool providers in big cities and small in every corner of the Golden State. So let's talk about rate reform. It's complicated, it's frustrating, but let's get into it. So we're advancing flexible funding and increasing payment rates to childcare providers to 75%, 75% of the 2018 regional market survey. So now providers can use these funds on any aspect of the business, but as we've heard today, it's expected a lot of these funds will be invested into wages. We've also established a working group, and we've needed this for many years. We established a working group to be able to assess how do we develop long-term reform for compensation of those who are the heart of the system, and those are the educators and the workers within childcare. And the way that the state, I'm gonna give you my own editorial if it's all right, and I wanna get your feedback. Um, the way that the state compensates providers, it is complicated, it is antiquated, and it's in need of modernization. Are you with me, Marin County? So, look, so this working group, so this working group won't be delivering their recommendations until late this summer or fall, and we also know, because of the crisis that we're facing, we can't make, wait to uh, make strategic investments. We're facing a childcare crisis. So let's take a look on what we're gonna be doing here in the coming few months to be able to adopt for this upcoming fiscal year that starts on July 1st. First of all, inflation is hurting childcare providers across the state, am I right? That's what I'm saying. Um, so this is a huge concern. And we're working right now on this year's budget. So that's why the state Senate is proposing uh, bringing forward priorities that focus on the reality that families are struggling with, with the rising cost of childcare. And we also know as you are facing inflation, you're literally trying to claw back from the biggest challenge that you've all seen in your lifetime, clawing back from the pandemic, am I right? So let's be clear, there is no COVID recovery in California without the recovery of the Golden State's childcare system, bottom line and full stop. So that's why in this year's budget that we're proposing, starting on July 1st, we're proposing an additional $1 billion in ongoing funds to increase childcare provider reimbursement rates to the 90th percentile of the regional market rate. So we need to do it, am I right? So this move, this move that we're proposing this year is going to bring rates to one of the strongest levels that we've seen in years. We're in negotiations right now with the state assembly and the governor on this, and we're gonna need you to organize and mobilize to be able to get this deal done. These funds are gonna be flexible. The funds could be used to support improved wages and benefits for the childcare workforce. They could be used to be able to assist you with modernizing facilities, and we can't stop there. We're also proposing additional tax rebates for working families for the childcare payments so they can write a portion of their childcare payments off of their state side of taxes. We're gonna uh, propose supplemental one-time monthly grants for families who are on CalWORKs and other low-income Californians. That's an additional 245 million. And let's talk about another investment, 445 million to support improved benefits for the childcare workforce and expansion of childcare facilities and infrastructure. Now we're also gonna continue to stabilize uh, California State Preschool by increasing the eligibility for low-income kids, increasing rate adjustment uh, factors to support preschool providers, and we're also gonna provide additional funding for long-term investments uh, in our ECE system. Here's where I think we are all frustrated and where the state Senate uh, is feeling. We have to stop talking about the crisis. We've talked about this crisis for literally years. And now the worst case scenario has hit us. We have to do something about it. And the budget is a value statement. If we value our kids, if we value each and every one of you who are taking care of our kids and our future, then we have to invest in each and every one of you. 
And I am a firm believer if we are organizing this year, we're going to see the biggest investment in California's child care system that we've seen in over a decade in 2023. Now, I also want to transition quickly to talk about K-12 public schools. I'm going to be super quick, I promise, and let's have a conversation. As we've shared, many of us before, I'm a big believer that the best investment that we can make as a community, as a state, and as a nation is in our kids. I'm a believer that public education is the ultimate equalizer in our society. And my mom and I struggled growing up, and I don't mean to get a bit emotional about it, but my one outlet that I had as a kid is in school. And it helped turn my life around, and I'll never forget it. And when you see struggle as a kid, you want to change that as an adult. And I am sick and tired of the fifth largest economy in the world under investing in preschool, under investing in childcare, and under investing in our public education system. So, <laughs> since 2015, we have gone from dead last in the nation in 2015. Mississippi was spending more on their kids than we were in California. We've gone from dead last in the nation to the mid 20s. And the rate that we are investing now in K 12 public education, we're gonna go into the top. 15 of states over the next 24 to 36 months. And we've finally advanced universal school, school breakfast and lunch. Now every student who needs a meal will get a meal guaranteed in every K-12 public school in the state of California. We're finally, we're finally increasing the funding for special education in our districts after years of flat budgets from the state of California. Every student who wants to go to community college for their first two years will be able to go to community college free of charge, thanks to each and every one of you, and it's about time. And I think we need to acknowledge the elephant in the room. The need for expanded social emotional learning tools have always been needing here in California, but the pandemic has shown us how important it truly is. The need is more acute than ever in our public education system. My wife is an elementary school principal and she sees it each and every day, the challenges that kids are facing. You see it every day, am I right? And this has been such an incredibly tough two years, tough for parents and teachers and school staff, but especially for our kids. And I, I hear it a lot. Our kids are resilient. They're going to get through it. This is different. The pandemic has impacted our kids like never before. And more important than ever, the state has to step up. Step up to become a much more engaged partner with schools, delivering the social emotional support needed to come back from this pandemic strong. So let's talk about what we're going to do. Number one, we're investing like never before. We're going to invest Right now, $265 million to expand community partnerships with nonprofits that can provide enhanced counseling and therapy to kids who need it most. That is now available, grant program for the California Department of Education. We've launched a $1 billion initiative designed to be able to expand infrastructure for providing universal, universal behavioral health care for all Californians, no matter your status, under the age of 26. Mental health care, <laughs> mental health care is health care. Am I right, ladies and gentlemen? And we need mental health parity here in the Cal state of California. And we're also advancing an innovative proposal to bring on 10,000 new marriage and family therapists, as well as healthcare professionals, and provide them, if they're in college and they dedicate two years minimum to a K-12 public school district, we will write them a $25,000 check to be able to erase $25,000 of their student debt going into school counseling. We desperately need new school counselors in our K-12 public schools. I'm gonna end it right here because I've gone on way too long and the most important part is hearing from each and one of you. We got some tough challenges in front of us here in the nation and throughout the state. But I'm a big believer that when we put our kids first, when we put our kids first, our communities thrive. It's as simple as that. And I promise you, I promise you there is much more to come from the state of California, and that is why I'm a firm believer with each of you in the lead that our best days are still ahead. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Let's get into a conversation. I wanna hear from each and every one of you. Thank you.
So, Madam Executive Director, I think we're going to take, uh, are we taking some questions, comments? And um, so we're going to take questions, comments, concerns, criticisms as well. Uh, come on up, fire away if you do have any. And um, really look forward to uh, our conversation, please. Come on down, as they say on the price is right. So, uh, Hey, good morning. Good morning. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. My name is Leah Ketching. I'm the coordinator for the Marin County Child Care Commission. What's up, Leah? Thank you so much for being here today. It is really amazing to see more politicians coming and talking about early education because it has been so largely pushed to the side yeah. um, until the pandemic. Um, I'm going to make a really quick shameless plug um, for all of your policy needs. Um, and all, if you want some more information about policy in California and Marin related to early child care, um, your local planning council, which is the Child Care Commission, it is different than MC3. I want to <laughs> we have the same acronyms, it's very confusing. Um, there's a sign-up sheet right outside, you can get our monthly newsletter. Um, so my question is, how is California planning on um, funding the current early childhood workforce? Because as we know, a lot of the money in last year's budget is going towards transitional kindergarten, which our early educators are not typically qualified to go teach, and it pulls children out of their programs and into the school system. And I know you talked about increasing reimbursement rates. Um, however, traditionally, that has not ended up as higher wages for educators. If you look at the trends for how little wages have been raised over the last year, it's really, really sad. Um, and we have a lot of really highly qualified early educators that are still not qualified to teach in transitional kindergarten. So that system is kind of not working out, I think, the way that it was intended to. Um, so I would love to know how you see California really getting money into the hands of the current early education system and that in a way that does actually get directly to educators. Leah, thank you so much. Uh, really great question. So first and foremost, um, where this working group is going to be delivering is talking about, we may be looking at, let me, let me back up. When we take a look at how uh, ECE childcare is funded in the state, as I said, it's incredibly complicated and it's based off of the region in which you live. And uh, it creates a system of have and have nots. Um, so we need to be able to look at a new way of funding. That is what this working group is proposing to be able to advance, uh, potentially blowing up this current structure, which again, it's an old structure. It doesn't work as you've well said. And no one should go to In-N-Out Burger and make more per hour than a childcare worker who's working in a state subsidized or a private childcare facility. It's unacceptable. So, number one, in the meantime, when I was talking about bringing it up to 90%, that is gonna be a significant increase uh, when it comes to actual wages. It will be flexible, I'll be really candid, it will be flexible. Uh, so, it could go into wages, it can go into other challenges, but what we really need to do, and I'm not trying to punt, and I want to get your feedback, we need to wait for these formal recommendations. And I firmly believe that we are at a time where we're going to see dedicated funding going to help with wages coming out of this working group. I know that in the Senate, we are absolutely focused on that because we can't find the workers to be able to fill the positions that would mean that we can expand the spots. So the state right now is saying 200,000 uh, new childcare spots. We think that there's the workforce for maybe 125,000 of those 200,000 new spots, maybe. So that's why you're gonna see, I believe coming out of this working group, dedicated funding uh, for those wages. Leah, I'll give you the last word. <laughs> thank you. Oh, I, no, I think you really addressed it. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, we, with all of this funding coming in, that's fantastic to fund new slots. Um, but what we're also seeing happening across the state is that uh, school districts that have a California state preschool program contract are pulling, their, pulling those contracts out to do t transitional kindergarten. Yeah. So we're actually losing CSPP slots um, throughout the state. Um, sometimes those can go to other providers within their counties. Sometimes they cannot um, if those providers are already not meeting um, their contracted slots. And so um, I think that's just also a really big concern um, that the field has going forward. And that would be something that I would really love for the state to look into um, with the impacts of transitional kindergarten on the current early childhood field. Thank you for that, Leah. And I'm not trying to be rude looking down. I'm literally taking notes as you're uh, saying. So thank you. I'm really grateful. Thank you. Hey, good morning. Nice to see you. Good morning. My name's Heidi Tomsky. I'm the executive director at Fairfax San Anselmo Children's Center and also the uh, 
chair of the uh, Child Care Commission for Marin County. Um, I would like to ask you to take back to your colleagues that we keep a mixed delivery system for our families so that they have the choice of where to bring their children, um, that the contracts uh, continue to be hold harmless for providers, uh, and that the, yes, <laughs> that the, uh, uh, the eligibility scales for families become regional rather than for the whole state of California so that high cost counties, um, families will have more access to uh, subsidized child care. I mean, it would be great for everybody, but at least start there. Sure. Um, I think what we are battling as a society is that the systems that we are working in right now are very narrowly defined and they were created by people that either didn't understand the impact of their decisions, um, were just uh, respectfully ignorant of, of the impact on the systems, or who didn't care about the impacts on the, uh, on the uh, excuse me, not systems, on the human race. And that, until we can change that, and as my colleague said, a trickle-down theory does not work. So to start at the top and go down is not going to work. So we all have to rise up um, and work together um, as a community to help our children and families. Heidi, thank you for And your our work. child care workers, of course. Yeah, absolutely. So <laughs> Heidi, I want to make sure that I have your three points uh, that you've mm -hmm. so eloquently articulated. One, uh, it's important in regards to the mixed delivery system to the hold harmless is really critical, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously continuing, and I know we are hearing that too on the K-12 side, mm -hmm. right, as we've looked at two years on that. And then continue with the regional approach, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. I just wanna make sure I got those down. Yeah, in a regional, uh, all, for Title V programs yeah. for families to be eligible, there's an income scale, right? Yeah. And to make that uh, eligibility scale, yes, uh, regional. Wonderful. Yeah, so okay. more families will be eligible. Thank you so much for your incredible thank work. You. And thank you for just drilling down on those so succinctly. Let's give a round of applause. Been doing please. it for a long time. I love it. <laughs> nice job. Thank you. Really grateful. Thank you. Hey, how you doing, sir? Nice to hey, see Senator, you. Hey, Senator, how are you? What's going down? Well, thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate everything you shared about the legislation. What I want to speak for is our small to mid-level nonprofits. I'm the executive director of San Geronimo Valley Community Center. We have first five programs, after school, daycare, team programs. And so I'm really excited about the funding you talked about, but I think I can speak for a lot of my colleagues here for small and mid-level nonprofits. Dealing with those contracts are really difficult for us. And most of our organizations just really don't have that kind of capacity um, around, you know, writing the proposals, the audits, everything that goes along with it. And, you know, we have a lot of support here from our county partners who hold our hand through that. And then, uh, you know, right after me is um, our community center is on the campus of the Lagunita School District that John's the superintendent of. And, um, and John helps us a lot, you know, when, when that money flows down. And, um, you know, I've been there 32 years, and really it's just been the last few years we've been able to have the capacity to deal with, the, you know, Supervisor Radoni holds our hand a lot through that too. So, but, so that's my question is, you know, how could our, our small and mid-level nonprofits that really is the core of this work have the capacity uh, when these funding sources come down to be able to handle it? Yeah, it's, uh, it's been a really difficult, hearing this from throughout the state so just meeting with first five up in humble right and they are saying the same thing of it is absolutely impossible to be able to to meet the needs of the state requirements right um it's something that i'm going to need to be able to bring back and again i am not trying to uh, not answer the question i don't have an answer yet it's something that we're going to need to be able to work through i hear you loud and clear and it is and i'm sure in this room and throughout the state it is a common theme of how challenging it is to be able to meet the demands, to be able to get the funding, right? And especially for smaller uh, community-based organizations, you're doing everything already, and then plus trying to figure out the paperwork, right? Um, and on the accountability side, 
I promise you I will bring this back and I'm happy to be able to talk with uh, and follow up with the executive director and we can have another conversation about this as well. Thank you so much. And thank you for 32 years. Round of applause, please. My goodness, thank you. Senator, I know you have a tight timeline, but I don't want to turn anyone away. It's really tight, but so like a one minute statement each. Okay, thank you. Wonderful. Hey, Superintendent. Hi, John Carroll from uh, Lagunitas and Bolina Stinson. Um, really quickly, just as an example, today, later today, I have a meeting with some of our amazing local preschool providers. They are nervous that I'm going to take away all their four-year-olds because we're going to have to within the next few years. That's going to have a huge economic impact on them. Um, we have great local providers right now, and I would advocate strongly to find a way to fund especially locally funded school districts so we can let them keep doing their work and funnel those funds to them because they know what they're doing, and I don't. Thanks. Thank you so much. Very grateful. Thank you. I heard an amen from the audience right there. So. Uh, Thank you. Hey, how you doing? Hi. Um, I really wanted to thank you for addressing the mental health of our children and thinking about curriculum, but I think we need to think about the health and well-being of our teachers first. Um, we cannot expect our teachers to show up and provide the healthy social-emotional spaces in the conditions that they are working in. Um, I work for a large provider, dual-funded state and Head Start. We have 150 staff. I've seen an increase in staff calling out sick and requesting vacation time, not because of COVID, but because they're overworked and underpaid. And this is a serious issue. We just had one of our family members come up and say the classroom was closed yesterday. So I really want to consider how we um, support our teachers who are working two jobs, who are showing up to the classrooms and trying to give all their best amongst the stresses of the pandemic. Thank you. No, thank you. And, and I know that we're on a really tight timeline. Um, but I'll just say is this, where I feel really frustrated. Mm -hmm. If this was a male dominated field, yeah. uh, we would see uh, these rates go up considerably. Yeah. Uh, and that is where uh, I feel incredibly frustrated. And it makes me so angry uh, that what you just said, uh, folks having to be able to work two jobs and the influential position that they have of raising, helping raise our kids, right? It's ridiculous. So I think the best way, again, what I don't like to hear is when elected officials come up and they talk about it, we have to use our budget as our value. If we value early education, if we value childcare in this state, then we're gonna pay childcare workers what they're worth. And that is the best way that we can deliver and to be able to help with the mental health and the stress, right? So uh, thank you for this. You. I will take it back and I'm grateful for your work. Thank, thank you. you so much. Hey. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Ann Matheson from Marin Promise Partnership. Nice to see you. I just wanna appreciate a couple of things uh, here today. The state is making unprecedented investments in early childhood and K-12, et cetera. We really love that. We really want to appreciate First Five in this room today for the number of people cross sector who are working together. And my pitch is that I think regionally and in Marin, we need some infrastructure in place and some funding in place. And I think Marin Community Foundation and the county are doing that for early childhood now. Marin Promise Partnership is a cross sector coalition. And we need that infrastructure so that when that money is there, A, we have the capacity to figure out, like Dave said, how to apply for it and get it and bring it to Marin, and B, that once it's here, we have the time and place to all work together to figure out how we can address you know, all of these issues for the whole population and not do it sector by sector by sector by sector, because there's, there's solutions out there, but we need the time and the, and the infrastructure and the process to make sure that that can happen here in Marin. And I think we're way down the, down the um, road to make that happen. But just, that's my plug. And Thank you. you're the best. Thank you so much. Round of applause, please, for Ann. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, hey. Hi, I'm Cheryl Paddock, North Marin Community Services. I'd like to um, add something to your piece of paper and that are mental health dollars for community-based nonprofits providing mental health support on school sites. So North Marin Community Services, Bay Area Community Resources, we face significant deficits. We dedicate all, many resources 
to serve underserved communities on school sites and the stipends you mentioned would not include us. And so please think about the stipends for marriage and family therapists, for licensed social workers who are working on school sites through contacted organizations like ours. No, absolutely. And just want to say thank you to Cheryl. She just does such fabulous work. Um, so the, the, the legislation that we're advancing right now with the California Department of Education is $250 million. Um, and it would give 10, it's a 60-40 split. So 60% of the $250 million would go to uh, public school districts to be able to provide um, funding to buy down that college debt up to $25,000. 40% of the funding would go to community-based organizations who have a contract with the school district to okay. do the same thing. Okay, great. Yeah, so it's, um, it is a 60-40 split, just heads up, but I completely agree with you, and it's the only way that we're going to be able to really expand the bandwidth that we need, and uh, we're just trying to nail this down in the budget this year. And then just to add to that, equity. So thinking about um, diversity training for all the all the um, pieces that you're advocating for because um, our kids need more support. They need more diverse educators. They need we need to support our teachers of color, and we're the most we're very proud to say we're the most diverse workforce we've ever been in the history of our 50 years. And so we want to support our um, workforce and provide more stipends so they can remain in, in nonprofit work. Thank you. Thank you. It's so good to see you. Thank you for your work. All right. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Have a wonderful weekend. Another round of applause. Let's give it up for First Five, everybody. Thank you. Before you, before you go, Senator, we know that you have a little toddler, so we wanted oh to send a little gosh. thank you gift you for so him, oh. and thank you for coming this You're morning. You're going to make me cry. Oh, my gosh. That is so nice. <laughs> and thank, thank you, you so much for being such a champion for our youngest oh, children. Thank you, thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for this. That is so of course, of thank course. Thank you. Take care. Wow. Thank you so much. So we've heard so much this morning. I feel a need to take a deep breath. I don't know if everyone feels that way, but I've been holding my breath all morning. Um, we've heard about from our panelists about so many challenges that we have ahead of us and what we've been facing and and also so many opportunities that we have. I wanted to acknowledge both the um, Supervisor Rodoni, who is a commissioner, as well as um, the board for dedicating some of the uh, American Rescue Plan dollars for the early childhood field, so thank you. I also wanted to acknowledge Don Jen from Marin Community Foundation for committing some dollars, as Aideen mentioned. These funds are going to be dedicated to identify, well, we know what the challenges are, not identifying them, but finding solutions in a collaborative way. We invite all of our partners here present and those that are not here today with us. We want to hear from parents. We want to hear from providers. We really want to find solutions that are sustainable and scalable. And I'm excited for what the future has for Marin County as it relates to early childhood. And um, I, I really look forward to working with all of you as we move forward in this work. And so with that, thank you again for coming. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you for our commissioners and, and all of you for all the work that you do. Thank you. Thank you.